Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Casey. I'm going to grab my Bible here. Wow. What happened? What happened during that? A bunch of, you guys sound amazing. This church is sounding good. The worst part about my job is that I have to leave worship to come up here. And um, yeah, you guys, you guys get going in that last song. And it just, yeah, it sounded amazing. Before we get started today, uh, I just want to say something. I've got a very special friend in the audience, and today is their birthday. I'm not going to, so this person, whoever you are, I'm not going to name you or anything like that, but I want them to know that I love them and that we as a church love them and support them, and so you know who you are. You'll feel that love and support. So we're starting a series on community. See, community is so important. We all need community. We all need to... Uh, to have friends in our lives, we all need to, to come around this idea that we're actually better together. So we're doing a, a two-week series called Better Together. Now, I don't want to hide the punchline for you. The punchline is that, is that we are better together. And that's what we're going to be unpacking for the next two weeks. And I thought, what, what better way to kind of start an illustration to help you guys understand where we're headed with this than to talk about this thing called group projects. I know that everyone has had to do a group project at some point in your life. I think for us, we really encountered group projects when Leafa was in grade six. And, and that seemed to be, was that the year of the project? Great, grade six at the green school, it was the year of group projects. And, and Leafa just had tons of them. He had absolutely tons of them, and he loved doing them, but we as parents did not love doing them. So, hello, any parents out there that have been through that, that primary school age where you just think, why are they sending home so many group projects to do? Now, group projects come with a dynamic. Okay, there's a dynamic that happens in a group project. Now, the first dynamic that we talk about when we think of a group project is there, there's different kinds of people that are in it. The first person I want to talk about is a doer. A doer. So what is a doer when it comes to group projects? This is, by definition, my wife. A doer is someone that says, I'm making an A on this. I'm going to do this work. I'm going to make sure I do the project. I'm going to make sure it, it comes out okay. And, and I'm going to make sure that the rest of the team doesn't mess it up. A doer is the person that wants to take control. A doer is the person that doesn't believe that the rest of the group can actually do the work. The doer is like, let me just do this work. Now, all of you type A perfectionists out there, people that, that had high marks all through school, when you got assigned a group project, you as a doer maybe thought, okay, I'm just going to have to come in here, and I'm going to have to do this, and I'm going to have to get this done. Right? My wife is shaking her head because I think my wife only made one less than perfect grade um, throughout her entire school year. So there's doers. A doer is part of a group project. It's an element of a group project. It's a personality behind a group project. The second person is a helper. So what is a helper? This is what Leafa, our son, is. Leafa is a helper. A helper says, hey, y'all can come to my house. Hey, my mom's got snacks. Or a helper is, is that kid that's like, yeah, we can just have everyone over and we can do this amazing project. We can send a rocket to the moon. We're going to do a full music video sheet. And they're like, Dad, can we get like a full lighting rig? Can we have this? It's like, no. A, I don't want anyone at my house, especially a bunch of grade sixes. And we can't do this. This isn't realistic. And so I was the dad that went to Builder's Warehouse and bought sort of pre-made kits while everyone else's parents were helping them make an electricity set in grade six. I just went and bought the thing. You put a battery in it and turned it on and Leafa took it to school. And that was it. I'm not a helper. I'm not a helper at all. But, but Leafa's a helper and a lot of you out there are helpers. So you're the one that's it's like, you come to my house. Now praise the Lord for helpers and for helper parents. We loved when we got to drop our child off in a helper's house because they would go to Mary Pack, they would buy all the stuff, there would be lunch, there would be pizza. It, it, was, it was an amazing experience. And what made it amazing is that I did not have to be part of it. So the la <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, I am a good parent. The last, <laughs> the last one to talk about is talkers. Now, I'm obviously a talker. 
I love the talking part. That's kind of why I'm up here. The talker is the person that says, when, and I can so identify with this. The talker is the person that says, okay, a group project is assigned. And in my mind, as a talker, I'm thinking, okay, if I get a good doer in this group, then I don't have to do anything. This is going to be great. So I prayed for people like Casey to be in my group. Like, Lord, let me be with the straight A student. Let me be with the person that is just obsessed about their grades. Let me be with them because then I'm totally sorted. In fact, if I act like a buffoon, then they will make sure I don't have to do anything. And so then I can coast through the group project, don't do any of the work, but then at the end, all these doers don't know how to present it. Well, me being a talker, I'd be like, hey, I got you. Time, time for me to pull my weight. You just load that project that you did on my sled, and I will, I will take it home for us. So I, I, I was a talker. The talkers are the people that, yeah, they just, they, they love that aspect of it. They, they, they love that. And I, I had that happen to me in college, and it just played out so well. It was just such a, such a blessing. I'm, I'm thinking about uh, a, a girl that I was in a group project with, maybe my junior year in university, and she was a doer, and the helper didn't come to class, and I was a talker, and yeah, we were doomed. So she did not have a good experience with that. But I make this point. To talk about group projects, to say, okay, there's, there's three kinds of people that make up a good group project. There's three, three types. If you get too many doers, then you miss out on the talking part, you miss out on the presentation, or too many doers, you don't have any helpers. Well, okay, everyone does their own version of the project in their house. If you have too many helpers but not a doer, you know, then... then yeah, you can have a fun time and you can have pizza, but you may not actually get the project done. And if there's too many talkers like me, well, you're not even going to make it to pizza or to a house because, you know, I would, actually, I, I would actually know what I had to score in my classes to kind of just keep an average middle of the road. And I would, I would say, you know, I don't actually need this project. I'll just take a zero on this. And so if you put too many of people like me in that, project, we're, you're definitely doomed. And so you need the right balance. Okay, so I'm talking about this, and I, this is where I want to bring it into our lives. And life for you, life for us, life is actually a group project. Because see, in life, you need different balances of people. You need to have doers, talkers, helpers. In life, we need to have each other. Life is better together. Why is life better together? Well, because the rest of the people on this planet are not like you. I'm so thankful that I'm unique. I'm so thankful that I'm one of a kind. Because I believe if there was more than one of me, we would be doomed. We would be in trouble. See, my life is better because I have Casey to be together with. I'm better together with her. In the leadership of this church, in the way that, that, that I lead, and I get to run this incredible organization that is South Point Church, I am so thankful for people like Trudy who run family ministries. I'm so thankful for Linton who's taken over so much of what we do with you guys. I'm thankful for Smiley that's doing production and band because we're becoming a team, like a group project. We're learning that life is better together. And I need other people. I need other people in every aspect of my life. So this is a point that I want you to soak in. So whether this is your first Sunday here, I know we had a lot of new people coming, and I just want to say thank you for coming. It, it always amazes me that you give an hour of your time, you give an hour and ten minutes or so of your time to come and be here with us. That to me is absolutely incredible. And because you come and you give time to us, I want to honor you. And I want to give you something that I believe is going to make your week better. It's going to make your day better. It's going to make, hopefully, your whole life together. And the thing that I want you to take home is this, that life is better together. But more than just saying life is better together, I'm actually going to show you why life is better together. I'm going to show you what it looks like to have different people in your life that fulfill different roles. 
just like we looked at in a group project. There's actually different roles, uh, different people can play a role in our life. And that's what we're going to look at. So through this whole message, I want you to be thinking about people that could be in your life that would fulfill three different things that we're going to talk about. Because at the end of this, and at the end of next week, I'm hoping that we feel inspired to find community. We're not afraid of opening up our lives to others. We're not nervous about letting other people into our lives. But instead, we feel inspired to say, I need some help. I need to do life with another person. I need community because I believe that life is better together. Now, to illustrate this, we're going to be reading a passage in Hebrews. It's chapter 10, and I've, I've put this on the screen for you in case you want to write it down, or in case you have a Bible or the, or the Bible app on your phone, you can look it up and read along with this. But I want to give you a little bit of context. So the book of Hebrews, it's towards the right side of the Bible, and in the right side of the Bible, you find this book, and we don't exactly know the author, so this is one of those books where people say, okay, maybe it was Paul, or maybe it was a guy named Apollo. We're not exactly sure who the author is. But what we do know is that Hebrews is, is this text that was written for people that were part of the original church. They kind of started the, the, the movement of following Jesus, which they called this thing called the way. And so they weren't considered Christians. They were considered followers of Jesus. Jesus had come. Jesus had died. Jesus had resurrected, and then the disciples went out, and people went out, and people decided, okay, we're going to start following Jesus, and we're going to tell others about Jesus. And if you could just imagine, as, as Jesus resurrects and goes into the sky, Christianity, or the way, just starts climbing in popularity. I mean, it's spreading like wildfire. But then all of a sudden, down the road a little bit, they started to receive a ton of persecution. They started to get picked on. They started to get bullied. They started to be murdered, to be killed, to be made martyrs, meaning they were dying for the cause. Because they considered themselves followers of Jesus, they were being put to death. And so here we have, in in Hebrews, we have this letter that's written to these people. These people who are saying, I'm I'm trying to do this thing. I'm trying to to live this life of, of following Jesus. I'm trying to live this life of of doing this with each other and doing this in community. And in fact, the first nine chapters of of Hebrews is just them being reminded about how good Christ is. And so after they're reminded about Christ, after they're reminded about Jesus and how good He is and what, what, what comes from their foundation of being loved by Him. So first, the author has tenderly cared for this audience. And this audience has been beaten up, and they've been bruised, and they've been disbanded. Now that's something that we can identify with. I want you to identify with that as like a starting point. You come into church, or you come to work on Monday, or just think about your life. There's hard parts in all of our lives. There's hard parts in all of our days. I mean, Monday is, I love Mondays personally because it's my day off. But for many of you, I mean, Monday is coming. And it's work day. Maybe you're going into an environment on Monday that's hard. Maybe it's harsh. Maybe today you go home for Sunday lunch. And you're meeting with people. Family. And you know that it's hard. It's tough. You've got drama in your lives. Hey, I know some of you guys carry drama. You've got drama in your lives. Whatever the reason that it is. But maybe you just feel that. And so we were created... For two relationships. We were created for a relationship with God. And that's why even if you don't believe in God, you crave that higher power. You crave that that knowledge that somebody is looking over you. Somebody cares about you. Somebody is interested in the details of your life. Well, I'm here to tell you, just as the author of Hebrews did, that Jesus is that. So you crave a relationship with God, and then you were made to have a relationship with each other. That's why we need each other, and that's why we crave each other. And so, we're going to open the text here to Hebrews 10. And I'm going to read this for you. And then then we're going to dive in, because there's some really, really good stuff here. Now, I want you to find yourself, after I read these verses, I want you to find yourself in this story, in Hebrews. But 
The verse I'm going to read and kind of explain to you as we go. So in verse 19, we start in Hebrews 10, 19. And he says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. So what he's saying is, hey, you guys that follow Jesus, because you follow Jesus, you can enter into a relationship with Jesus confidently. So that, that's what that means. Verse, verse 20. By a new way, by, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God. Now, what he's saying there is when Jesus died, now this is such a cool story. When Jesus died, there was in the temple, there was a physical like curtain. There was a veil that separated the Holy of Holies place from the rest of people. Now, people, normal people, could not go behind this curtain into the Holy of Holies because if they did, God would strike them down. That, that's what the Jewish people believed, is that they could not enter that place. That was only reserved for a high priest or somebody like that. And so what, what happened when Jesus died, when he gave up his life on the cross for us, there was an actual physical tearing of that curtain. And what that signified and represented literally was that people had physical access to walk into the most holy of places. And so the author of Hebrews here, in, in these first couple verses that we've read, he's setting that up. He's saying, guys, remember, because of what Jesus did, remember, remember your foundation. Remember where you came from. Remember why you believed what you believed. Remember how Jesus came before you. Remember the promises in your life. Remember the blessing that Jesus was for you. Remember, because of that, you get to walk in this freedom because of what Jesus did for you. So after he reminds them of that, he starts into these, these three statements. And they, they start here in verse 22. It says, Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Verse 23, let us hold answeringly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Verse 24, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Now 25, I love verse 25, especially as a pastor of a church, because this is very comforting to me. Not giving up meeting together, which means it's good for you guys to come here. So not, getting, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now something key is being said in this scripture. And if you missed it, I'll tell you what it is. There's three statements in this scripture that are said over and over and over again. Now anytime we look in the Bible, if something is repeated, then it's important. So anytime we look in the Bible, if something is repeated, it's important. Anything we see in the Bible, if something's repeated, it's important. Okay, thank you. I thought, well, if I have to do this ten times, then, yeah, then I will. I'm just glad you guys are, are listening. But that, that's so true. And, and in this situation, we have these three let us statements. Now, that's what we're going to zero in on here is these three let us statements. The first statement is this, let us draw near to God. So what does that mean? That means that we draw near to God. That means that we walk into a relationship with God. That means that it takes more than just me to have a good relationship with God or Jesus. I actually need some help. So I have an example for you. When Before I moved to South Africa, I was running a construction company. And in this construction company, I was making great money. Life was kind of sorted. I was, I was coasting through, had amazing friends, had just an amazing setup, had a good house, all these things. But God had put on my heart this calling, this calling to, to go out into the world, to go to a different country, a foreign land, and to help build the church. Now, to do that, you would think, hey, you need to have a really good relationship with God if you're going to hear God's voice. Well, I was so fortunate, I had three other guys, Zach, Jay, and Quentin. And the three of us, we started meeting on Thursday nights every week. 
And on those Thursday nights, we challenge, we challenge each other, but in a good way. It's like they helped me draw closer to God. And what I mean by drawing closer to God is they just helped me to, to enter into a great relationship with Jesus. See, I needed to hear God's voice as I felt like God was telling me to leave everything I owned, sell everything that I had, everything. And pack only everything that I could into three duffel bags, get on an airplane, and come to a foreign country. Now, because those three guys helped me dig into a relationship with Jesus, and I'm not talking about like a Bible study. I'm not talking about helping me memorize scripture. I'm not talking about them saying like, hey, did you have your quiet time today? Oh, you need to have your quiet time. If you're going to be a missionary, you got to have a quiet time. It wasn't that way. It was just the three of us getting together and them saying, just this simple question, hey, how are you and Jesus? How, how are you and Jesus doing? I love asking that question to people. It catches them off guard. But that's a question that anyone can answer, whether you believe in Jesus or not. How are you and Jesus doing? And I would say, you know what? Not great. Because I don't quite know what's going on. I don't know what's going on with this calling or these open doors or whatever. And they would just encourage me and say, listen, man, you don't have to figure it all out. Just be close to Jesus. Just make sure you and Jesus are just chatting, having a conversation. And these guys helped me stay close so that I felt confident when I heard God say, now it's time for you to go. So I quit my job, sold everything I had, and I moved here. And so part of me being here in front of you guys is because I had three other men helping me draw near to God. Now, Growing in your personal relationship with God, it was never meant to be an alone thing. It's a we thing. It's a we thing. We need each other. Your relationship with God, if it's just you alone and you never open that up to anybody else, then you're missing so much potential that comes from just letting other people help you draw near to Him. Because we need each other. We need help. Okay? That, that's number one is that we need each other to draw near to God. Now, the second let us statement that I have for you is this. Let us hold on to hope. Let us hold on to hope. Now, what does that mean? That means, now this is where where we can really identify with this. Have you found yourself in a situation, maybe this year, last year, today, this morning, last Friday, where you were struggling to hope. Now, what's it mean to struggle to hope? Maybe you're struggling to believe that tomorrow is going to be a better day. Maybe you're struggling to believe that this afternoon is going to be a better afternoon. Maybe you're struggling to believe that Monday morning is going to be a better Monday at work. Or maybe what you're doing is you're holding on to life and you're saying, no, 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 no. No matter what comes at me, I'm going to hold on to hope. Meaning, I'm going to still believe that there's good out there, there's better out there, there's more out there for me. I'm going to believe that the world is good. But inside, you're starting to crack and you're starting to think, but is it actually good? Is it actually going to be good? Listen, it's okay to be hopeless. It's okay to have no hope. That's okay. But it's not okay if you do it alone. See, we need each other to help us hold on to hope. I'll give you an example. I I talk about my mental health quite a bit because I want to normalize. I want to normalize these things called depression and anxiety. You know, they're such bad words to so many people. But you all have it. Most of us are anxious about something. Or we deal with ups and downs in our life. We deal with depression. We deal with these things. Well, I'm married to an amazing woman who decided that she was not going to let me lose hope. And so one year, I think it was two years ago on my birthday, Casey gave me this little tin. And inside this little tin was a stack of cards, like business cards. And on these business cards, on one side, it had like a picture, and it had something to do with my mustache, right? had something to do with my mustache, and it said something. But on the back of the card, it was empty. I thought, great, you gave me a ten of empty cards. But what she did is every day, 
for 365 days without fail, whether we were good or not good, whether I was kind or not kind, whether our marriage was in the right place or in the wrong place, every day for 365 days, I woke up in the morning and there was a card for me. And it spoke life over me. It was an affirmation for me. It was a declaration of her love for me. And for 365 days, whether I was depressed or anxious or not, I woke up every morning and had somebody that was helping me hold on to hope. Now, that's just my, my wife and I. Now, we've not often had community. When we moved to Cape Town, it was just us. I mean, you imagine a, a young family, me, Casey, Lipa, moving to Cape Town from White River. White River, South, I don't know if you all know where White River is, but go to Kruger and then take like a 20-minute drive back from Kruger and you're, you're in White River. And we went from White River living this sort of idyllic life to moving to Cape Town thinking, man, this is going to be incredible and this city is awesome and there's the mountain and the promenade and the police actually mostly work and the fire truck comes if there's a fire and what, there's, this is amazing. We love this. We're going to get a church up and running and it's just going to be absolutely incredible. But it didn't happen that way. We spent three years seeking community, seeking connectedness to somebody. And so for three years, the only people, the only person that I had helping me hold on to hope locally was my wife. And the only person that she had was me. Now, that was an amazing thing for our relationship, and it made us stronger, and it built us, and I believe God used that to make us stronger so that we could even help lead this church. But guys, I'm telling you, look in this room. One of the things that we didn't have for those three years is we weren't sitting in a room like this looking around with 150 other people that were here for the same reason. When you look around, if you find yourself that you need to, to hold on to hope, you, you find yourself running out of hope? Well, guys, look around. We've got a full auditorium this morning, and there's people joining us online. See, one of the things that, that we want to do as South Point Church, this has been my goal this year, is I want to make it impossible to have a flat tire in Cape Town without getting help. I want to make it impossible to have a bad day without somebody speaking encouragement into your life. I want to make it impossible in Cape Town for somebody to be alone. I want to make it nearly impossible for somebody to not find a community that they can be a part of. See, th th this isn't about us raising up just a bunch of people that are just, you know, speaking Christian language to each other. This is about raising up real community that are really helping each other, that are in each other's messy lives, that are a part of the down, that are a part of the depressions, that are a part of when, when life falls apart. And what you want to do when life falls apart is you want to hide. And inside, you've got no hope. Your hope is running out. And when your hope runs out, that's such a dangerous place to be. Now, the author of Hebrews is saying, hold on to hope. Now, we know why we hold on to hope. We know it's because we have Jesus behind us and with us and in us. But not everyone has that. And everyone, whether they have Jesus or not, everyone deserves to be able to hold on to hope. And everyone deserves to have somebody, some form of community that's helping them hold on to hope. Now, the last let us statement is, is one that I think is probably my favorite. It's let us spur each other on. What this means is we're going to encourage each other. See, if we're left to our own devices, what do we do? We take, we, we cut corners, we take shortcuts, we kind of cheat a little bit. You know, if you've been at the gym and you're working out, it's really easy to kind of cheat on that last set. Or if you're counting your calories, you know, trying to, you know, be on a diet and you're you know, counting your, your yogurt, it's really easy to say, okay, I've got 150 grams in my bowl, but then you're also like, you've had four spoonfuls, but those don't count because they're not actually in the bowl, you know, or the whole tablespoon of peanut butter, you know, listen, if your peanut butter is stacked this high on your spoon, that's not a tablespoon of peanut butter. See, it's easy to do that because it's just you, but we need people to help us and to encourage us. So a funny story that I'll tell you is, is this, is that I had this guy that 
So there's a guy in this church named David. David's huge. He's the size of a doorway. He's a big, big guy, and he's solid muscle. But he's got an incredible heart. And Casey was working out with David. David was, was teaching Casey how to do deadlifts and how to bench and how to do all this stuff. And, and Casey was doing these amazing workouts with David. And I made the mistake one time of saying, David, I can work. I can take one of these workouts. Now, I was running a lot at the time, so I had like zero muscle on my body. But I said, you can't break my mind. My mind is too strong for you to break. And so David shows up at our house. And it took him maybe three minutes to break me. And he worked me to death. And I just remember the last set of what we were doing. Is, is David, we had, he had me doing these front squats. You hold the bar in front and you squat. And you're supposed to squat all the way to the ground. And I was like doing this. And I was trembling. And I may have been crying. But he didn't know because there was sweat coming down out of my face. And David's going, okay, we're going to do 10. And I'm thinking, like, I can't even do 0.5. And we get to 9, 9 of me doing, doing this. And David goes, okay, 3 more. And, I, and at that point, I was like, I, I, can't, I can't do this at all. And so I think I just closed my eyes and counted, just counted to 3. But David spurred me on. See, we need each other to spur each other on because when we spur each other on, when we encourage each other, we help each other to not cut corners. We help each other to not take shortcuts. You know where the most dangerous place to cut a corner or take a shortcut is? is it's the way you think about yourself. It's the way that you see yourself. It's the way that you interact with yourself. See, it takes discipline to say, you know what? I may have messed up that situation, but I'm still a child of God. I'm still loved. My value is still good. My value is still found in Jesus. I can still be proud of who I am. That's hard to do. Instead, we take a shortcut. And the shortcut that we take is we say, man, I'm worthless. Or, man, I just, I'm going to shut today down and hopefully tomorrow is a better day. But when we have friends in our life, when we have community in our life that spurs us on, that community says, you are absolutely not going to take a shortcut on how you think about yourself. You're absolutely not going to take a shortcut on how you talk about yourself. You're absolutely not going to take a shortcut on your marriage. You're not going to take a shortcut on your friendships. You're not going to take a shortcut on your job. You're not going to take that, that little bit where you think, you know what, I can get away with this. Because you've got people in your life that are spurring you on, that are encouraging you, that are pushing you. When is it that muscle is built? It's built on the last two or three reps. That's where the magic happens. See, we can take ourselves only so far. But then when we get ourselves to a point where we just can't go any further, that's when this community comes in. And that's when they encourage you and they help you spur on and they help you get those extra reps and you know what it feels like to have your your love muscle grown to have your your community muscle grown in your life man you feel unstoppable you feel irresistible it's an amazing thing that I want for you because I now have that not only do I have it with Casey I have it with many people in this church I have it with Smiley up here on guitar. Smiley works for us, yes, but Smiley's my friend. And he encourages me. I'm 38 years old, he's 21, and he encourages me all the time. See, we, we can do that with each other. And so, let me tell you this. Where do you find these people? Where do you find these people that you can build community with? Where do you find the let us people? See, Here's the truth. If you show up in the right places, you'll find the right people. If you show up in the right places, you'll find the right people. If you want to find the wrong people, you know where to go, right? Everyone knows where to go. But if you want to find the right people, it's harder to find out where to go. That's where I hope that the church steps in. And I hope that the church provides a place where, where there's just a whole bunch of right people in here to come around and be community. And because we're so different and we're so diverse and we're so, we're just, we're not the same thing. This is so good because when we come to this place, we find people just like us. And that, that's, that's what we need for each other. See, I want to challenge you with this. I want to challenge you to be the person that you're looking for. See, 
you're looking, so many of us say, I wish I had community. I wish I had a best friend. I wish I had somebody that loved me or took care of me. I wish I had somebody that wrote a note for me every single day, no matter what, for a year. Well, you know what? Go and be that person to somebody else. I'm just asking you to take a step. I'm asking you to maybe get out of your comfort zone a little bit and just take a step. And when you take a step towards being the person that you want for your life, man, you become that for someone else, and then they turn around and they reciprocate that and they give that back to you. See, community is two-way. It's a two-way street here. And so that's why we're putting a massive amount of effort into building this church around the value of this. Everyone, everyone deserves to have some kind of community around them. Everyone deserves somebody else. No one deserves to be alone. So I want to challenge you guys to let yourself be a let us person and to go and be for somebody what you're looking for in your life. And so I'm going to pray for us. And just like we do every week as we close the sermon out, is this moment of prayer is for you to think and reflect on what we've talked about. See, the, the author of Hebrews, he felt it so important to remind these people who were hurting and disjointed and who were questioning everything, which we can all identify with, and he just wanted to remind them that we need each other, we need community, but that we can draw near to God. We can help each other just have hope when we feel hopeless, and we can encourage each other along. We can spur each other along. And he knew that the trick to it was community. And so as, as I invite you to stand after I pray, I want you to think about that while the band sings. Because when you go out there, life happens. But before you go out there and before life happens, before things get crazy, before Sunday lunch happens or before whatever, I just want to give you some time to reflect on what we've talked about this morning. And I specifically want you to think about these three people. Do you have someone in your life that helps you draw near to God? Do you have someone in your life that helps you with, with, with hope, that helps you to remain hopeful? And do you have someone in your life that encourages you? Are they in your life? And are you that for someone else? Because listen, we're all better together. If we come together, we all win. We're all better. No bad day wins because we have each other and we're better together. So Lord, we come to you in prayer this